afternoon for this inaugural lecture by Honorary Professor Peter Paul the Big. He is going to talk to you today about our technological condition, technology, and the politics of the technology. I've been, I'm actually quite glued on this, on this occasion. I've been struggling for this for the past four years. I think we've been in negotiations both with Peter Paul, of course, and his family, <laughs> and uh, with the institution uh, as such, for reasons that I need not go in depth here. Um, my name is Lars Bowden, by the way, Uzi in Danish. When I talk English, I tend to say Bowden. Um, and I'm head of the Technical Anthropology and Participation Group at the Department of Planning, Oldbrook University. And Peter Paul is attached to our research group as um, honorary professor for the coming four and a half years. years by now. We had a very good meeting this afternoon, after noon, <laughs> uh, where we made some arrangements for the future. And Peter Paul is going to give some workshops and seminars during the years that are to come, hopefully to twice a year for both the campus in Copenhagen and all of work in a joint event for uh, researchers and for students that take on the post phenomenological take on doing projects and doing research and as such. And here I mentioned the very unpronounceable <laughs> term, post-phenomenology, and that uh, Peter Paul, we've been joking this afternoon, is a sort of king or wise king, I don't know. <laughs> you, you should take that with an ID. I'm a servant. <laughs> <laughs> and all the others are uh, dance and Peter Paul's uh, servants. <laughs> Uh, talking about Peter, Peter Paul, shut up, <laughs> Doing research in post phenomenology and talking about post phenomenology also in our uh, teaching. And also for that reason, I'm very pleased uh, to have Peter Paul part of our group. But without further delay, I will hand it over again. We're very honored and proud to have you here. I'll hand it over to this headset. Great. To you. Thank you. And afterwards, after Peter Paul's lecture, that should last for an hour or perhaps a bit more because Peter Paul has got 75 slides. <laughs> I don't need to do that all. So don't worry. I will look at your face and see how. There will be a the reception out there in the big canteen. Questions. Yes, there will be a session of uh, questions or comments, of course, after the lecture. And I, I hope you will yeah. participate. <laughs> okay, okay. take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this nice introduction. The honor is all mine, of course. It's really great to be here. It's actually really nice. I mean, uh, my, my chair in Twente is in the philosophy of humans and technologies. You hardly see that humans and technologies combine, and then here is a techno anthropology program. It's such a natural match. It's uh, it's awesome that uh, that I can can be here. So thank you so much. So what I would like to do in this talk is, uh, of course, just to give you a bit of an overview of stuff that I'm working on in order to establish the connection between our work in Twente and what you're doing here. Also to link it a bit explicitly to anthropology. So I will open with some kind of a window on anthropological theories. Uh, theories about the human being that include technology and understanding what it means to be human. And then uh, to conclude with uh, a section on the politics of technology, uh, a perspective from that post phenomenological approach or this mediation approach to technology and see how much we can make of uh, well, this theme uh, that uh, not many people have been working on yet, I guess, in, in our approach and that is, I think, ready for some, for some more work. And so, maybe first some in introductory Things. I think um, if you think about anthropology and technology, I think uh, if people hear the word anthropology, they don't think about technology. They, they think about the history of, of the human being, and then they think about this stone axe or something. Not about 
about an iPhone. Still, I think this picture that I just happened to find on the internet uh, is a very nice illustration, I think, of how we could maybe think about technology. Now, technology as something quite recent, as something alien to the humans that we have to learn to adapt to somehow, but just like that stone axe constituted the human being in a specific way, and actually the way in which we even organize the human history is in terms of the technologies people use, and the stone is the iron age, bronze age, it's all the tool that we have. There is no human in the past that you could imagine without any tool use. So, for some reason, it's hard to even think humans and technologies apart from each other. Technologies are included in every understanding of what it means to be human. Still, I think in a lot of our thinking about the human being, we make this strict separation. And I think that has a lot to do with how we have come to think after the Enlightenment about how the world is organized and should be organized in terms of subjects and objects. Right? Humans are subjects with consciousness, with intentions, with freedom. Uh, Technology belongs to the world of, of objects. They're silent, mute, they don't have intentions. Humans use technologies, but they're neutral in themselves. In if you kill somebody with a hammer, it's not a hammer's fault, it's the fault of the humans. The humans have the intentions. That's interesting. So, in our deepest approach to the world, there is a distinction, subject and object, that does not do justice to the things that you could feel if you see this picture. Actually, to understand what that subject is, you need to include those objects. And I think the question of how we can include technologies in our understanding of what it means to be human becomes all the more urgent now that we are actually also merging humans and technologies uh, even more. There's ever more technologies in human beings, implants in our brains even, that help to organize how we feel, how we behave, how we interact with other people, the brain stimulation. But also there's ever more humanity and technology. Social robots that learn to behave socially, that learn to interpret people's behavior. At the university where I work, I work a lot with a professor of social robotics who is working all the time on how comfortable people feel when a technology uh, is in the room, when a robot approaches them, how the robot will interact with the human being and how humans will somehow respond to the robot. So the boundary is being blurred more and more. This, of course, also raises a lot of worries and expectations. I think the discussion is already a bit beyond its climax, but we used to have a long discussion about human enhancement. And are we actually changing the human into some kind of a superhuman? Are we moving towards a successor of the current human being who is beyond Homo sapiens sapiens? And maybe we should find new words, new categories to describe what the human being is doing. All the transhumanists in that movement had that idea. But actually, maybe in retrospect, they were not that transhumanistic as we thought they would be, because in fact, they maybe were more hyperhumanistic and they would enhance a lot of the things that we attach to humans. But really, the idea that we should put the human at stake and go beyond the human, that's not what they want. Currently, those people are writing all kinds of scary books about super intelligence and uh, the Internet of Things linked to AI systems might lead to a world where the computer might take over and might not need the human being anymore. Abolishing the human being apparently was a bridge too far for those people. And of course there are the, uh, the gloomy people who believe that technologies do not make us much, much better actually. And that we, we are not going up, we are going down, or maybe even to a point that technologies might have such a strong life of their own that the humans might be so redundant. There are a lot of complicated relations between humans and technology. How, how, how should we see that? How should we understand it? Are we indeed going to be replaced? Is that a realistic perspective? Or will robots also live their lives in a world where there are also humans? Can we live together like we now also live with, with dogs and cows and ants? And why couldn't we live together somehow? Will it make life better or worse? How, how can we understand those relations? Maybe a last remark before uh, I, I go to the three lines that I will sketch out in my, in my talk. It's, it's also interesting to see how different people speak about technology than they speak about science. If it's about science, I'm not sure how this here in Denmark, but in Holland we have some of the, the famous scientists who are in the news all the time, and they're happy and cheerful, and they come to report about the latest achievements of the, of the heroes in the academy, and that's really uh, something funny. Huh? So I think Einstein is the icon for that. And, uh, you have postcards where you have Einstein with his tongue out of his mouth, and it's kind of a 
a nerdy guy, but it's cheerful. Science, that is Einstein. Technology, that's Frankenstein. Yeah, that's a different uh, style. <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, apparently, uh, all the genius that's needed to do science can also be used in a bad way. Then you do technology, and then you threaten society, and uh, yeah, we go downhill. It's interesting. How, how could it be? How have we come to see technology as so alien to ourselves? Uh, while we see science as a big achievement, technology is something that is somehow some kind of threat. Okay, so some introductory remarks to somehow problematize the relation between yours and technologies. Now, I would like to do uh, three things. First, try to explore a bit how technology has been seen as part of the, well, the human being as part of what somehow makes it possible to be a human being in the first place. Human as a condition, what conditions our human existence. And second, after that, I will try to explore a bit what that then could imply for something you could call techno-anthropology, understanding human technology relations, where this approach of technological mediation uh, working on to play a central role. <clears throat> and I try to also work a bit towards the boundaries of that approach in order to make the last step was politics, which is a theme that has not been explored too much yet in that approach, and I think it's about time that we, that we start doing that. Okay, so let's first go to the condition of the human being. There are actually quite some approaches in the history of uh, philosophical anthropology that give technology quite a central place, and so this maybe is more of a class than of my own work. Is giving you a few of those ideas that can help us understand all kinds of ways in which technologies have been thought into the human being, you would say. Le Roi Gourand, for instance, who has this central idea there are two things that really, well, uh, make the difference uh, for a human being to come into existence and have everything to do with technology. The first is that we uh, went to, uh, what we, the, that we started to walk on, on two feet. So if you made our hands free, we don't need them to, to walk anymore. So we could use them to, well, to use things. Use suddenly becomes a category. And it also had a lot of influence actually on the development of our brains, where the codex came into being. It gave us language, it gave us memory, it gave us creativity. Those two things uh, for him were really the central features of how the human being has come into being where actually time and memory has come to play a very, very central role. It's not only the memory that we have because of the functioning of our cortex. Of course, we also have a memory in our DNA, our genetic material that we pass on and to our children. That's a form of memory, it's the second memory. But the third memory is the artifacts that we make, that we use, that we pass on, that stay after we, we die. It's a complicated set of, let's say, time-conquering things that make us human, that gives us some kind of a durability and the possibility to have a different type of evolution than other animals have, have had. It's interesting. There, there's no way to understand how we have evolved as humans then to take technology into account. And Ernst Kapp, who's often seen as the founding father of the philosophy of technology, and who already, I think, uh, halfway the 19th century, who wrote a quite influential text about technology, and something like the basics of a philosophy of technology, good linien and a philosophy of technik, has this whole theory of technology also being closely linked to the human body. He sees technologies as projections of our organs. There's no other way to understand how we ever got the idea to, to make a hammer, Krapp says, than to see it as some kind of externalization of our fist, but then a stronger one, a better one. Or a saw, eh, which is modeled, he says, after our teeth. And we can do things with our teeth that we can do better with a saw. Or a telegraph system, eh, high tech in his days, is our nerve system, actually, in which people have just been discovering. So he says there's an interesting parallel between our bodies and technologies. Technologies are not alien to us, they do not belong just in the world of objects, so they're externalizations. It's kind of a dialectical approach, kind of a Hegelian idea that. Parts of ourselves are being externalized into the material world, and then we develop a relation with them, and it tells us something about ourselves also. Interestingly, it's also actually a reversal of the Cartesian universe, where people thought that um, actually we should understand the body in mechanical terms, and the heart becomes a pump, and the vessels become tubes, etc. And that view sees the human as 
technology, but this is exactly the opposite. You see technology as something organic. It's interesting. So there is another way to link humans and technologies very closely. Well, as soon as you see that the idea of technology is an externalization of ourselves, of course you can start to ask ourselves how we then develop ourselves and then in interaction with the technologies. People like Galen, and we will see some more names later, have as a central theme that humans should be seen as manipulated, as beings with a difference, as something missing. We typically like to see ourselves as animals with something extra, with reason or language or something. But in fact, a lot of philosophical anthropologists like to conceptualize the human being as an animal that's lacking something. And we don't have those very strong claws or jaws or whatever. They're okay, but they're not really good enough to survive in, uh, in nature. And also, typically, the way in which we are born makes us extremely vulnerable. And actually, in a sense, we are born prematurely. It's because we have such huge heads. If we would stay longer in the bodies of our mothers, our mothers would not survive giving birth to us. So we need to get out while we are still very young and dependent. If a horse is born, they just walk away. But if it takes us a, a year, at least my kids, one year and a half, I'd say. <laughs> so it's a, it's a completely different situation that we, in a sense, have developed as a human. Because of our big heads, we also start life with a backlog. And we need to compensate for that with technology. So the technologies will externalize and also get used as some kind of augmentations, additions, ways to strengthen ourselves, ways to somehow replace organs or to somehow facilitate labor. There is a, an interesting dialectic also between humans and technology. And so the dialectic is externalization of ourselves and then also interaction with what we externalize of ourselves, which also learns us something about it. Well, that theme, the last two authors I just want to bring in as an anthropological basis for techno-anthropology. The theme also plays a big role in the work of thinkers like uh, those two, like Helmut Plessner, who had this central notion of eccentricity. Uh, the, the idea that you can only understand humans as beings who stand outside of themselves, who do not go inside of themselves, but who can always observe themselves see where they are, look over their shoulders to what they do, which makes them free, which makes them responsible, which, which also makes them artificial. They can play a role. There is never a total direct experience, but there's always this second voice, an awareness of the fact that you do have that experience. So there is never something totally direct. There's always an artificiality in there. And what she calls the natural artificiality. Our nature is not to have nature. Our nature is to be artificial. It's, it's, it's artificial to say that we, we have a nature. Stiegler also says that beautifully in his neo-Marxist approach, for instance, it's kind of a mix of Heideggerianism and Marxism, where he sees techniques as the default in, in French. Yeah? Default means two things. On the one hand, it means default, like the default settings, the, the, well, the standard settings of a human being. It also means something is missing. A shortage, a lack of something. So our default settings is that there is something missing. And that makes us technological by nature. There is an open novel for originary technicity, as he says it, which makes technology then a pharmaca with the, the old Greek word, which means both a medication and a, and a poison. We cannot do without it. There is no other way. We need to augment ourselves. We need to take the medicine, otherwise we cannot survive. At the same time, it affects us, it changes us, it makes us different beings. We need technologies to do things, but therefore they also have an influence on how we do them. So it alienates us while also making us authentically human at the same time. It's this double face. So interestingly, the big separation that we have come to make ever since the Enlightenment between the subject and the object seems to so evaporate if you take a more scientific look or a historical look at how to understand the human being. It's not so easy to keep technology out. It's actually impossible. There's no way to understand the human being in another way than technological. Techno-anthropology is maybe the, the default setting of anthropology. And then looking back, you can even see that there is in a lot of uh, old texts already, in a lot of uh, myth that we tell about ourselves. The ancient Greek myth of, uh, maybe you still know this, but the Prometheus. Uh, which is actually all about technology, uh, where the gods 
put all the creatures on a, on a line and they gave all of them their properties. So the birds got their, their wings, the fish got their fins, and at the end of the line there was a human, and then the gods ran out of properties. There was nothing left. <laughs> so humans had to go home without anything to save themselves. And then Prometheus stole the fire from the gods, for which he was heavily punished. But then we at least had something. The default setting was something was missing. Technology compensates for that. I think you can even say that the biblical story of the God of Eden is a story like that. So that mythological origin of the human being, uh, where we've probably never been, in, in a sense, uh, it plays a role because of one important thing, that we were kicked out. So it's kind of a of a, of a horizon of, of a world where there was no technology, but the human being starts to exist when there is no paradise anymore. And so you have to work for your food, you have to clothe yourself, you are aware that you're naked, you have to, to work on, on the soil. Uh, things do not come out automatically, but you, you have to do something yourself. So the fall in the old biblical story is also, I would say, a story about the origin of the human being as a technological origin. We have to work, we have to use tools to work because it doesn't go automatically as it and went in that mythological image of paradise. That's interesting. So, how then to understand more deeply and in more detail that interrelation between humans and technology? So, let's then move to the techno anthropology, which maybe could get as a subtitle something like mediated humanity. Mediated in the sense that technologies can be seen as mediators, as what? Well, elements that mediate how we are humans. Maybe a nice uh, image to start with is uh, this image. Uh, a very inspiring artwork of Hugo Stella. Uh, many of you must, must know him, uh, at least when you're in techno anthropology. You should know of Stella's work. So he's an artist who has been exploring the relation between humans and technology throughout his, his all, his all yeah, total over it. It's still doing that. This is actually quite an old work, but there's a lot in it. The third hand it is called. So what he did is that he uh, got himself a third hand attached to his uh, right lower arm, which he could operate with the muscles of that arm. So he had one arm to operate, two hands. So that's really complicated. <laughs> uh, but he learned to do that. It was part of the the whole thing that he wanted to do. So you could watch him learning to operate those two hands. And he would do performances which would have as their climax that he would actually write with three hands at the same time. So most of us cannot even make a square with one hand and a circle with the other at the same time. At least I can't. Most people seem not to be able to do that. Well, I think he, he can. He can even use three <coughs> hands. Evolution. Is that the word that you wanted to write? Three times three letters, that works very nicely. And so you could see him do that. And of course, I think if you see this for the first time, it really has this alienating effect, right? So is this then indeed the future of, of, of humankind? Is this what evolution goes to what? Should we interfere so deeply into, into ourselves? Hands are also really very human, right? Even already in the theory of the Wuhan, that we we freed our hands to use, but our hands we used to, to point at things, to wave, to greet, to cuddle, to cherish. Uh, hands are, are very human, and then seeing an extra robotic hand is, is quite weird. At the same time, he's, he's doing another thing uh, with those hands that we don't even see as a technology anymore, but which actually is maybe one of the most influential technologies that ever came to be. That's simply that he's writing, writing that word evolution. In the days that humans started to write, the conservative philosophers of those days, called Socrates, Plato, <laughs> uh, had a lot of issues, ethical issues with writing. A bit the same as a lot of more conservative thinkers now have a lot of issues with new technology. Plato was really afraid of writing. People would then be able to memorize things. In those days, people could, of course, tell long stories uh, from their heart. And Plato was also kind of neurotic about how people would understand his ideas. So he felt that if people would write them down, other people would read them without him being there to explain his ideas. And well, maybe they could 
get a wrong understanding of its ideas. And so, of course, there is the central feature of our uh, culture, of the, the culture of the book, of the word, uh, that is not the end of civilization, as they feel, but it was the beginning of a new civilization. Even a, a whole new religious system came into being. Uh, the Bible, the book, what you think. So, and you could even ask yourself what a new religious system could be now that the books are becoming so outdated and we have other media that determine our, our culture. So apparently we can expand ourselves with technologies. The technology of writing has become so important that we don't even see it as something technological. It belongs to the human being. If people cannot read or write, we see it as a problem. A worldwide anti alphabetism program. All people need to read and, and to write. So how then to use that idea to overcome this split that I showed in the beginning, to overcome that split between humans and technology? Well, I think the proposal of that approach of mediation, which is a way to do the post phenomenology trick, is to actually stop seeing technologies as part of that world of objects. Basically, I think phenomenology has always tried to understand human world relations subject-object relations somehow. And I think the central uh, feature of phenomenology is that they said, well, actually, it's a mistake to separate the two because they're always related. You can never have the subject separately because the subject always sees something, hears something, thinks something. There's always some kind of directedness at the world. And the world in itself will probably exist. It doesn't make much sense to ask yourself, does the world in itself exist? Because as soon as you ask the very question, it already stops being the world in itself. It becomes the world for you, as you disclose it, interpret it. So it's all about the relations between the two. Well then, this post phenomenological approach says that we should stop seeing technology as part of the world. Technology is, in fact, part of the relation. Technology links us to the world. It's not an object, but it's actually some kind of a connection between human beings and their world. And if you go into uh, some more details, you can say, well, that human world relation has then two dimensions. Technologies help to shape how human beings are there in their world, how they do things, how they behave, how they, how they act, how they develop social uh, uh, practices. And on the other hand, they help to shape how the world is there for humans, how we perceive the world, experience the world, interpret the world, understand things. Those two lines are always there. And this offers them maybe an approach to think technology a bit more closely into the human, not as a physical part of the human, but as an inevitable element of the way in which we are human. If you cannot understand the human without the relation with the world, and the relation is always somehow mediated by technologies, then you cannot understand the human without those mediated technologies. That's the basic idea of the mediation approach. That's and how you could say technology as the way in which human existence is somehow conditioned could be understood. And then there are many ways in which you could work on that. You must have seen, if you haven't seen anything of Don Eide, Don Eide's way of doing that, and exploring all the various ways in which technologies that can play that role in that relation between humans and the world. Either teaming up with the humans, being embodied, like a pair of glasses that you don't look at but through, or teaming up with the world, giving you some kind of representation of the world that needs to be read by humans, like a thermometer, and it doesn't give you a sensation, it gives you information. Or interacting with the technology, like an like ATM, but the world behind it is not so relevant, you just want to get your money. Or a contextual role of technology that experience directly, but contextualizing how you do things. That's actually then the next step. So Don Eide tries to investigate how technologies it can have various roles in that human world relation. And this has actually formed the basis for a lot of work in a post phenomenological tradition. So people start to investigate how scientists actually use technologies and how technologies inform their knowledge, how, how instruments help to shape scientific work and actually and the interpretation of phenomena. Just to, uh, to mention a few examples. Oh, one example. But then, of course, the trick for the moment is that a lot of the technology that we now have indeed seem to be somehow beyond this scheme. And that the human enhancement technologies, and I mentioned briefly at the beginning, like an implant in the brain, is more intimate than an embodiment relation. 
if you have an implant in your brain because you have Parkinson's and the implant stimulates the production of dopamine because of which you can walk again, it might also affect your moods, your temper, and people can, can feel very good and become really uh, manic, hypomanic, change who, who they are. And then to ask yourself who made that decision to behave like this cannot be answered why. Well. There was a technology that made you do that. It's also a part of you that's addressed by the technology. It's like some kind of a hybrid agent. And at the other extreme, and not more intimate than the embodiment relation, but more external than the, than the background relation, is a, is a smart environment, an environment that interacts with us, that detects us, houses that can detect the mood that you're in and adapt the light accordingly, you, decide whether or not the phone should ring, whether or not the, and the doorbell should, uh, should ring, what music to play, etc. Or maybe even further away from us, indeed, again, that idea of robots as some kind of autonomous agents that make decisions on their own that have an impact on us too. So you can expand the scheme of an idea. You can go on with this forever. I think a lot of new technologies ask for a new analysis of how they play a role in the human population. How do they organize the interaction between humans in the world? And then how do they affect practices, perceptions, etc. So it can be quite a fruitful thing to do. At the same time, for many people, this is not a comfortable idea. If technology indeed conditions human existence so profoundly, is there then still any way to somehow resist technology, to be somehow critical, to do an ethics or even a politics of technology? Can we say no? Is there a way to somehow uh, well, uh, yeah, to resist what technologies are doing to us? I mean, we all remember the days of the Industrial Revolution, actually the reason for Marxism to come into being. The factories that had a lot of negative implications for the work of laborers. When we thought we had developed the perfect slaves, all the stupid work now could be done by the machines and the humans would have time for nice other things. Well, in the end, it appeared to be totally the opposite. Rather than the machines being slaves of the humans, the humans became slaves of the machines because the factories needed to have a lot of production. It's really expensive to, to build such a factory. And, and the banks uh, need to get their money back, so the owners of the factories need to have a lot of production. Speed goes up, and the machines can now do everything. So for the humans, it was left to do what the machines could not do, the stupid work like so connecting the threads or cleaning the dust or whatever. So it changed human labor a lot. It threatened human beings and to the extent that you could see so nicely in that movie Modern Times where uh, well, the subject is swallowed by the object, you would say. <coughs> Shouldn't we be a bit afraid of technology? And you can bring technology into the human being and explain how we should blur the boundaries, etc. Is there still a possibility to be critical of that? I think an important first step is then to, to lose that fear. And then I will try to explore in the more political part how we can develop an alternative approach. So, to lose fears requires a uh, a good psychiatrist, uh, Freud, uh, uh, who you could use, but maybe in a somewhat different way than uh, uh, people would expect uh, me to do now. Maybe I will not take you into a psychoanalysis, but actually I, I want to build a bit upon Freud's ideas about what he called human narcissism. The idea that we like ourselves a lot. He, he, he wrote very nicely about science and narcissism, and I think we can expand that to technology. So he says that there is some, some form of narcissism in human beings that we really like ourselves a lot, and we often see the science as part of the great achievements of human beings, and all the reasons why the famous scientists can be on TV and tell about all the heroic stories. But Freud says, well, actually, often, like a boomerang, scientific knowledge hits back on the humans. It doesn't make us bigger, it makes us smaller. And when Copernicus showed that actually the Earth is moving around the Sun rather than the Sun around the Earth, it made us a bit more humble. When Darwin showed that, showed that we are at least as close to the apes as to God, it made us also a bit more humble. And he himself uh, aims to show that actually what we call our person is nothing more than a thin layer of resistance and a bubbling pool of uh, subconscious, half-conscious uh, lust and desire that we don't even dare 
to look into the eyes. So there you go for the narcissism. system. There's not much there. Well, maybe technology is yet another blow to the narcissistic self-image in the sense that all our ideas and our fantasies of being autonomous beings, having the possibility to make our own decisions, to make something out of our own lives, which is obviously a decentral feature of what it means to be human, the autonomous subject. Well, technologies often, of course, limit that autonomy. They have a lot of influence on us. There's technologies inside our bodies with the brain implants, and in our material world with the smart environments trying to steer our behavior, even our thoughts. Can you still believe in a human being then? Well, I think with Freud in your hand, you could also put that whole thing upside down. Because you could also see technology indeed as the basis for being autonomous. But maybe that autonomous in the sense that and you can make anything out of yourself, then I have to speak with Dennis Joplin, and you can say freedom is just another word, but nothing left to lose. And then, you, and then, then that, there is no resistance, there is not even a world in which we live. But maybe freedom is the way in which we could, could deal with the powers that are being exerted on us. I always like to show examples of technologies that influence our normativity, our ethics. Because for many people, ethics is really the crown jewel of humanity, right? If, if technologies influence our, our ethics, then we're lost. I mean, that's something like 1984, Brave New World, uh, of ethical ideas are our, our own. And that's not something that you want to be steered by technology. Well, there are a lot of examples of how technologies actually influence our ethical framework. If you go to the supermarket, the question whether or not you should return your card to the place where you got it, unless you know how it works here in Denmark. We have coin locks in the Netherlands. Do you have them too here yeah. in Denmark? Yes, yes. So, uh, of course, you can leave it to the conscience uh, of uh, the customer, or you can hire a teenager and you know, do all that stuff. But yeah, for a few bucks, you have uh, the coin lock. And then that thing doesn't think it embodies the norm. Put me back in the place where you go. It's not deep philosophy, but you cannot understand this without taking any normative consideration in, into account. There is a form of normativity in that uh, matter. It helps us make a moral decision. Just like there are values in technology. I always like to show this example as also a Twente example. A long time ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, in Twente we had an exhibition on sexist objects whole exhibition uh, uh, with a lot of devices that had some element of gender stereotyping. And this was one of the nicest examples that I, I, I thought Philips was quite good at this <laughs> type of design. So this was the, the lady shape of those days. I have no idea what they look like nowadays, but uh, it's obviously it's a bit 1980s, 90s maybe, post-modernistic look. Um, but if you had a lady shape as a woman, um, and it stopped functioning, there was no way to do anything about it. There was no, uh, well, I, I said they were sealed, there was no screw, they were, they were not openable, <laughs> they were melted as it So if it stopped functioning, you had to throw it away, buy a new one. Females were not supposed to be uh, interested in, or maybe even capable of <laughs> entering the interiors of the devices, whereas a man would get this exploding view. <laughs> <laughs> and a little toolbox, if you were lucky, with a screwdriver to open it, and a little brush to uh, take off all the hair. Uh, it's quite a different. As a man, you were the engineer of your device, and women were not even supposed to be interested in, in, in opening it. Interesting. Values about masculinity and femininity can end up in materiality as well. Maybe the nicest example that I came across, also, I think, from that period, is from Henri Moll. You know, you know the example, birth control pill. Um, but she, she gave a very interesting talk, uh, and which was announced as a talk on the pill, the birth control pill, and emancipation, and liberation. And everybody thought, oh, it's going to be boring. We know that story. Yeah. Maybe you, you know those numbers. It's really uh, very fascinating to see the parallels between the introduction of the birth control pill and the social position of women. And the number of kids that women get suddenly goes down on and from 3.3 to 1.6 or something. The age at which the first child comes moves from around the 20s to around the 30s. The income goes up quite rapidly. Uh, 
Incredible. If there's one thing that did something for the emancipation of women, it was the birth control pill. So everyone said, yeah, we know that story. What's how are we going to add to that? Well, she added a lot because the talk was not about uh, the emancipation of women, but about the emancipation of homosexuals, which was, of course, a puzzling thing for people because homosexuals don't need the birth control pill. So how could you even think of giving a talk on that? Once you see it, it becomes uh, obvious almost. But her talk was actually about the fact that you could make the same parallel that you can make between the introduction of the pill and the social role of women, you can make that between the introduction of the pill and the, the ethical acceptance of homosexuality. You see a sharp change in argumentation that you see in articles, in journals, as from the moment that the birth control pill became really well, an obvious thing that most people would use at some point in their lives, most would, women would use at some point in their, in their lives. And the reason for that is that she showed that a lot of the arguments against homosexuality uh, before the control of the birth control pill was introduced were built upon a sharp distinction between sexuality and or upon uh, how do I say it? Between the fact that there was not a sharp distinction between sex and reproduction. There was always a connection between having sex and getting a child. There was no technology that could really make you certain that if you would have sex that you would not get a child until the birth control pill was there. So there was no way to even think about sexuality without thinking about reproduction. And now the birth control pill was there. And everybody has sex because they like it and if they want a the child, they can stop taking the pill. We, we separated the two. And in that world in which you can just have sex without having to think about getting a child from the start, it becomes much easier to accept homosexuality. In the old days it was unnatural, weird, strange, dirty even to have sex without even being able to get a child. But yeah, that's what everybody is doing now all the time. Interesting. Because it's a very touchy subject. And of course, it didn't force people to accept homosexuality. There are still people, obviously, uh, who have issues with it, unfortunately. But it is, nevertheless, a striking thing, I would say. And technology has the potential to change very deep ethical conviction. So much for autonomy. And uh, Blood and Freud, I would say. Well, <laughs> speaking about sex, it's always Blood and Freud, maybe. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. So maybe, indeed, we should accept this technological condition of the human. We should do a techno anthropology all the way and then understand what it implies. That's actually the project that I'm currently working on in, uh, in Twente, where we tried with a whole team of people uh, to develop this approach of mediation further. And actually, with a bit of Irony, because I'm not quite a Kantian, uh, we build it uh, tongue in cheek on the three main questions that a philosopher can ask uh, him or herself for Kant. What can I know? What ought I to do? And what can I hope? So, typically, questions about knowledge, science, how to understand that, moral about ethics and morality, and about metaphysics and religion. And interestingly, I think. Those questions, the, the way in which we answer those questions, can all three be thought as mediated by technologies. As I said already, there is no scientist who can do scientific work without using technologies that somehow help scientists to make sense of the world. If you take away the technology, you would have a different world. And the same for ethics and metaphysics. If you think about um, neuroscience, for instance, that the whole idea of fMRI imaging brings in a totally new paradigm of understanding human beings. If a psychologist now wants to explain uh, the behavior of a teenager, for instance, you would typically get a story about the prefrontal cortex and how it uh, and how that uh, has all kinds of uh, turbulence in the, in the age of adolescence. It gives you a completely different way of reading the brain than you would, for instance, have with the uh, EEG. And Freud, to go back to him, <laughs> would also have his version of why an adolescent behaves so unresponsibly. And because uh, he or she has to separate from herself from the mother. And so it's different ways of getting in touch with the behavior of people through sofa associations and we talk through an EEG that gives you a kind of representation of activity in the brain of fMRI imaging and showing how the brain functions when it is doing its, its work. It's interesting. Technologies even shape the content of scientific knowledge. And we're actually now studying that with the idea, building a bit upon earlier work in post of uh, 
technologies as uh, uh, well, uh, engines of epistemology, you could say. Whereas the, the old idea was, was that often technologies function as some kind of a, a model for understanding how a phenomenon works. And the power, etc., is a model for how the heart works. Now, you can maybe say that actually what technology do is not just being a model, but they organize the perceptions of scientists and therefore the ways in which they could even interpret <coughs> the world. Technologies are very deep into our understanding of the world. We should not see technologies as applied science, but science as applied technologies. That's maybe the big thing that you could draw from this uh, story. The same for ethics. So we saw some examples already of the ethical um, character of technology, the ways in which technologies help us to do ethics. You can even say that of course also technologies change normative frameworks. And this example, I always find it a, a nice example, if you uh, take a look at the historical discussion about privacy, you see that a lot of the discussion that we have now have their some kind of predecessors uh, in, in, in other discussions. For instance, when the streetlights were introduced in some major cities, People who wrote a very nice book about that, uh, where he highlights a lot of the societal discussions about streetlights. And they actually look a lot of, uh, like the discussion we now have about the internet. Imagine a world where there were no streetlights. So it would be dark, and it would be dark, and you could do all kinds of things in the dark <coughs> that uh, could not uh, bear the daylight. Uh, all the things we do now on the internet. Uh, and suddenly, at night, it was light on the street, and people really protested that there was no room in the sense that, of course, there were all uh, uh, weird arguments, but basically there was no room for extramarital relations and dubious business transactions, etc. Now, there was all this light on the street. Apparently, our conception of what our own privacy means takes shape in interaction with the technology that somehow threatens it. The values that we use are not just pre-given and then we apply them to technology, they are themselves also mediated by the technologies we evaluate with them. That makes ethics quite a complicated thing, right? There's no independent yardstick, but the yardstick is influenced by the thing it wants to, to measure. <coughs> and you see the same thing basically nowadays still. I travel a lot by train or by, by bus. You maybe know this uh, thing. I must say phones are hardly used for calling anymore those days. <laughs> but uh, when people still did that, you would often end up uh, hearing somebody have a very personal phone call with somebody else, sitting next to that person and hearing all kinds of details about somebody's life that you don't even want to know. <coughs> Somehow, this phone organizes a relation between the person and the person she is talking to, that, in which that other person on the other end of the line feels closer than the person sitting physically next to her. Right? So it organizes when you draw the boundary between the private and the public. We've even done, uh, quite recently, an empirical study online to see if we could actually empirically see how ethical frameworks and values develop in interaction with new technologies. So Olya Kudina, one of my PhD students in the Future Project, did an empirical study uh, uh, on um, online discussions on YouTube, where people would discuss videos of people wearing Google Glass. So um, there was a limited number of um, glasses uh, given, well actually you <laughs> buy them to people, I think like 3,000 or something. Uh, and then uh, Google asks you to upload videos of you using that. Well, of course, uh, the idea of Google Ads, I'm sure that everybody is aware how that was supposed to work. It never came. Uh, and so it has a screen that you can look through, it has a, a camera, it has a microphone and it has a speaker that gives a sound on your skull so you can hear it but other people cannot hear it. And the idea was that actually it would disclose the world in a new way for you. It would make your mobile device less intrusive. You would not need to look at the phone or you would just see it. But of course the camera can also have face detection. You see somebody on the street and automatically the name pops up the latest post on Twitter or on Facebook, etc. And it would give you of course a completely new orientation in your, in your world. So people had a lot of concerns, and actually it was really nice to see that when we analyzed how people voiced their concerns about privacy, that it ended up being a completely different concept of privacy than the concepts typically found in the, in the in textbooks. Most of the concepts that people implicitly used were about the privacy of interaction. So the privacy of being not entirely private. So what will happen to a, a conversation between two people? 
because one of them is wearing Google Glass. Can you be sure that the person is really looking at you or watching a movie? Or that the person is not taking pictures of you somehow or looking up at things about you on the internet? What will happen to that realm? It's interesting. So people, you could see how people redefine the concept when thinking about technology. Um, maybe I should skip the uh, last example, maybe just give you one single thing about technology and religion. But also, I think the interesting thing is that typically people make an opposition between those two. Where technology is actually in power over the world, and religion has to do something with openness and the boundaries of what's makeable, what's, and it's, it's more about faith, what, what comes to you, what's given somehow. The Vatican is against IVF because uh, a child is not made, but you somehow uh, could say that you receive a child. And technology is that uh, enables us to make life, are therefore denying that essential religious dimension of newborn life. Well, uh, a very limited empirical research of myself, knowing some friends who got their kids through IVF, teaches me that actually for them, uh, that experience of getting a child through IVF had nothing to do with makeability or manipulation. I think for them it was maybe even a bigger miracle that they finally got the child through those technologies and that they really well. So we, we've made a child. So, but of course, their experience of getting a child was totally different than people who do not need those technologies to, to do that. So apparently this experience of something transcendent is also mediated by technologies. How can we understand that? You can say the same, not for life, but for, for death. In Twente, there's now a group of neuroscientists working on a new technique, a very sensitive technique to read the, the activity of the brain, with which they actually see a lot of activity in the brain of people who are normally considered to be dead, but they consider to be somehow in the boundaries of brain death. Which is interesting, because we consider them to be dead in the sense of that it's the, they will never get alive anymore. But there is still a little bit of them working. But this technology can then also shift the boundary between life and death. Where is that? How, well, how much can we control that? If, if, if there seems to be one thing fixed, it's oh, when you're dead, you're dead. Well, apparently there's only a mediated access to, <coughs> to death. Okay, so technology in the human, in a second, um, there's uh, ways to think about it. With Mediation. Now, can I take 10 minutes for yeah, the yeah. context of technology or is it too long? Yeah, can, you, can you bear with that? <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll go really fast. So, um, we've seen a lot of ways in which we can think technology into the human. And I already opened the second part with the question that is this really the way to go? Is there still a way to be critical somehow? And this is exactly a discussion that has popped up over the uh, last well, decade maybe. For instance, with people like Andrew Feinberg, uh, a very nice person actually, but also a very critical person towards post technology, who always says, well, it's really good stuff, and you can make all those nice analyses of technology and what they do to you, but where's the politics? You know, what's at stake? Then can't you be a bit more activistic? Whereas, actually, I've always felt that uh, a too easy opposition between humans on the one hand uh, and technologies on the other hand, kept out or tamed somehow because they do undesirable things, fakes that there is some kind of place outside of technology from which we can be critical. I always look for a place to, to do that from within, acknowledging that even your normative frameworks are also technologically mediated. Can you still do it? So this is a big discussion. And it's a long discussion. It is a discussion that already went on between big uh, names like Karl Marx and Martin Heidegger. Uh, where Marx said that uh, all the philosophers have tried to understand and interpret the world, now it's time to change it. And where Heidegger gave the reply, well, actually, uh, that's an interesting remark, but in order to make a remark, you already have to interpret the world as something that you can change. So, uh, what's first? The phenomenological attempt to, to make sense of the world or the activist way of dealing with it. Now, of course, Marx was a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. And, um, you could frame it as a story, as I already did, uh, of objects oppressing subjects. 
But maybe the mediation approach also enables you to see it as a story of mediation. This picture was taken actually in a factory that was just behind the place where I live in Enschede. Enschede, uh, where the University of Twente is, used to be a textile factory region until the 1960s when it all collapsed. And uh, I find this always a very shocking picture. If you see the hollow looks on those faces, the tired faces, and this, this is what those technologies did to human beings. They did not replace labor, they did not replace the human, but they actually changed it in a specific way. They, they mediated what labor was. Well, um, I think there are two ways then to try to get in touch with that politics of technology. Understanding how technology has a, what, a charge, a value in terms of uh, that framework. Um, maybe I should give you one last example as, a, as an introduction. The classical example, I think many of you must know this example, Langdon Winner's example, the, the low hanging old pass of the parkway on Long Island, New York, built so low that only cars can go below there, no buses. If you cannot afford a car, you cannot use the road, you cannot go to the beach. Black people in those days could not afford cars. So that was an old pass to keep out black people. Taken from the Heidi's car, by the way, this, this picture. Somebody I saw the other side. Hey, this is an example of language women. I think, post humanologically speaking, there are two lines that you can explore to understand the whole political significance of technology. One is about power, and that's actually the line that's often being used, that's almost always being used. The language winner showed that the rich has power. By Andrew Feinberg showed that technologies have power over people, that companies exert power over people through technologies. But there's also a second line that I'm currently uh, trying to uh, uh, well, uh, understand better. And that's the line that comes not from Marx, but from Dewey. Politics has something that people do. That the whole practice approach. Politics is not only about a power struggle. Politics is about how to make a policy. How, to, uh, how do people come together? How do they interact around issues that are at stake? That's how Dewey conceives of politics. Politics is when people have a concern that they share and that they want to talk about in order to solve it. Both can be at the micro level of people using technologies. Technologies exerting power over them when they use them, technologies shaping how that interaction and engagement comes about. Let's first explore the, the role of technology and, and power. Uh, maybe first uh, just a full-blown neo-Marxist analysis. Uh, last summer I went to South Africa, and I had some experience with Booking.com. Uh, we, we were in a small house, and I had a chat with the owner of the house, and I said, well, it must be so great for you that there's this internet now. We found you on Booking.com. Many people can find you now, and they could not find you before Booking.com was there. Uh, well, I better not say that, because then suddenly a whole bottle of acid was emptied over me. <laughs> he came with his stories about Booking.com, and indeed, this is, this is a terrible story. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, well, I think a fine example of old-fashioned capitalism. So Google.com works like this. Um, they pay a lot of money to Google. They're the biggest customer of Google. Everyone who searches on accommodation, uh, you will always get as a first hit the hit to the page of Booking.com. Always. Google guarantees that to Booking. So there's no escape. Even if you don't offer your accommodation to Booking, you'll be the first hit. Then, um, of course, if you, uh, for instance, have a hotel with say 30 rooms and you can say, oh, I'll attempt your booking and the rest I, I do myself. But if those 10 are full, the system gives you a message, sorry, you can have full. <laughs> but you have 20 open. So what people do is they offer the end everything to booking.com. Mm. The booking asks a commission. And it started with 15% and now only 25%. 25% of the money that you pay if you book a room through booking goes to booking, not to the hotel owner. For the same price, you can book at the, the, the site of the hotel itself, and then all the money goes to the hotel room. Then he tried to somewhat protest against uh, that, and then Google said, oh, you have issues, well, then, you, then we put you on hold. So, uh, and that means that if you now Google for him, then they say, sorry, you cannot make any bookings in this hotel anymore. <laughs> uh, so then he had to beg to please to be online again, and he went to another site, which is called TripAdvisor, you must know that, and you can have a business a, a thing there, you pay a thousand euros a year, and then you can actually do the bookings also through that site. So he paid that, and when it was all set, the bookings appeared to go through booking.com. <laughs> so 
there was no escape. It cost them a lot of money. And uh, yeah, it's just the power that the organization has, you could say. But uh, in, in a Marxist world, you could say, okay, this is just a fine example of capitalism. The internet is a new base for a new superstructure, if you see that in new Marxist terms. What a new kind of monopoly, you could say. It's, it's not just a market that this guy has, but it's, it's the entire infrastructure that's now owned. So the very conditions for the functioning of society is actually working there. And there's this extra element I want to also work a bit towards this idea of fake news as a, as a theme. You have a lot of fake news on Putin. <laughs> so for, for instance, this idea in high demand, only four rooms left on, on our side. Often uh, it means that it's only four for a specific price that they mention. They, they try to somehow make you feel stressed and that you uh, book more rooms. So also the ways in which we make decisions are being influenced. And we are forced to go to booking almost. And so you can say this is a nice example of the power of technology. For fake news in the normal sense of the word, you can see that as well. And maybe, you know, this fake news that is one of the, the, the most important examples, I think. And the, uh, the idea that the Pope would endorse Donald Trump and it was, that was big news at some point, it was all nonsense. Well, that's actually, if you try to read that through the neo Marxist eyes, then it becomes a bit more complicated. And then we, I think, need to move a bit more towards the phenomenological and Julian approach. So I think neo Marxists would say this is an example of the culture industry. Like I don't know what Horkheimer would say in the dialectic of enlightenment. Uh, it keeps the masses, in a sense, passive, poorly informed. The media have all the power over the people. That, that was the idea of uh, those neo marxist analyses. The funny thing is that the fake news discussion actually does quite the opposite. It's now bypassing the media that seems undemocratic. If a president doesn't want to speak to, to the media, all those dishonest people on their own, uh, but uses his own account on Twitter to talk to the people, that's what people feel as undemocratic, because it's not interpreted anymore by the press. Interesting. So the media apparently have stopped being oppressive, and the culture industry that keeps the people stupid has now become part of the infrastructure that makes us citizens. So apparently we have come to the point that we start to see the media as mediators, obviously, of culture and of engagement. But that also means maybe that we need to develop an understanding of politics beyond power and overpower the people. I think that's not what you can do with the concept of engagement and with do. So a few words about that to conclude. Actually, I think that word do, even though it's quite old, is really inspiring and it also goes together quite well with uh, an approach of mediation. In fact, it was also used uh, by some people in act network theory to develop uh, ideas of politics. But a tour to Roger Marais. For John Dewey, the idea was that a democracy is ultimately not only about the state and the laws that there are in a state, there are always things that are not arranged well. The, the laws are not totally fair, people get concerns, and it's not a machine and once it's running, it's all done. There are always externalities. And then suddenly, if they pop up, there, and that's the beginning of real uh, discussions, concerns. That's where a policy comes into being. People have a concern. They come together to discuss that, and they want to vote, they want to protest, they want to start a party. That's politics, and that's at the micro level how it works. Well, as I said, Roger Marais and also Bruno Latour have built upon that idea to understand politics in terms also of activity. Roger Marais wrote a very interesting dissertation, No Issue, No Public, where she tries to show how, well, you could see politics as the coming about of issues together, some kind of public around themselves. And Latour even used that idea of public. I to, 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 to think about something like the republic, the res publica, the old Latin word, which means like the, the thing politics, where thing, also I think in Danish, thing is the word for parliament. Right? It's, it's a place where people come together. It's also a material thing. It's also a word to indicate that something can be at stake somehow. So politics then is about issues in the public. Mediation theory then comes in, I would say, to ask ourselves how technology that mediate the formation of publics and how they mediate the issues themselves. How does something become an issue and how do people come together around those issues? Do technologies mediate the public into a demos, as Hannah Arendt would say, with more plurality? As a populist, the people, as all Trump likes to see the people. 
is it some kind of public in a more old-fashioned Julian style, a bit more uh, on a distance? And how do they mediate what's at stake? Yeah, and how can we actually see the discussion about fake news as somehow being ultimately about that? It's not only about somehow manipulating the people, but about taking the core out of politics. So, for the tour, as I said, politics is about things, a public gathering around issues where actually he says there's always some kind of a double representation at stake. The people are being represented in the parliament, some people speak on behalf of the people, but there's also an issue at stake. There are facts at stake that are somehow being represented. And as soon as they are at stake, they stop being matters of fact, as he said, but they start being matters of concern. Things that are at stake, not just factual things, but concerns that people have. Well, the question is then, how do technologies organize this? And I think ultimately this is maybe where you could see the discussion about fake news. The public of those days, of course, was typically immediate through digital technologies. And on the one hand, that's through the media that gives information, but maybe on the other hand, it's also, and it's not on this slide, but it's also through a lot of technology that we now see in the so-called smart cities. That way we can read the city in new ways. All the sensor networks that can then analyze the water of the sewage systems, and we know in which neighborhoods people take a lot of medication, a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs. And you can actually see on camera images with big data where people are really lonely, you hardly have any visitors, etc. It's interesting to see how people um, can read those data streams and actually can get into contact with the city with each other in a new way. But the, the people is somehow mediated by technology. But fake news, of course, then being a real danger because of course, on the, on, on the one hand, uh, the media, digital technology are the basis for the coming together. On the other hand, if fake news start to deserve, starts to determine that, where are we as a team? So, um, the interesting thing then maybe is to be aware of the fact that this should not only be about the matters of fact. It should not be what you often see in academia is that people say, okay, and now we should tell Donald Trump there is really such a thing as climate change. And all people who don't believe that they are stupid. Of course, I also do think that there is something like climate change. But I think ultimately, if you say there's only one answer, that's the facts and nothing but the facts, then you even give up on the idea of politics in the first place. I think the idea of fact-free politics could actually be quite a nice thing. <laughs> because if it would only about, be about facts, then we don't need politics anymore at all. What's at stake is the concerns. How do concerns come about? Can we still have a place to debate our concerns about climate change? And that's maybe the biggest danger of fake news, that it actually undermines the way in which things can become a matter of concern. Saying that science should have the final answer cannot be the, the final answer. At the same time, maybe you can say that with a Julian perspective, the discussion of fake news is actually maybe ultimately a very political thing. Because uh, fake news itself has now become a matter of concern. We're talking about it all the time. Right? It, it somehow also brings the idea of something like the truth to the center of political tension. How can we trust the media? How should we deal with the media? The old neo-Marxist discussion, in a sense, takes on a totally new guise. It gathers a public, it shapes a community, and actually it itself becomes a, a thing, right? a place where people come together to discuss. And of course, then ultimately it also reveals some kind of a vulnerability of politics. Well, maybe that's uh, a thing to keep in mind. You could also even say that what we did in Google Glass is something like that. That YouTube forum, where people voiced their concerns about Google Glass, is also a thing eh, where, in fact, also facts are turned into concerns and people frame what's at stake for Google Glass. So what could you learn from them that then in a political way. And you could say, okay, Google Ads is a product Google, powerful company exploiting us as powerful individuals. But you could also say, no, we could approach Google Glass as a thing that brings together humans around concerns and that somehow, uh, well, shapes a public and the explorers of Google Glass who put online those videos and the people who are concerned when they see that, they interact with each other online with a good discussion, but also the issues that are at stake are being mediated by technology. Suddenly they frame the concept of privacy in new dimensions, and funnily enough, those are mediated by glass 
itself is not just a kind of representation, but it's totally mediated by glass itself. And then, of course, it doesn't stop. You can not only understand that, but as soon as you see that, you can take responsibility for that in using Google Glass in a critical way or in designing Google Glass in a critical way. I think that's maybe one of the most important things to do. And that's then also the last thing that I wanted to say and to tell you uh, in a few words a bit about how we do that in Twente and how I hope to, to, to do that here uh, too. The Design Lab in Twente is a place where we try to do such things, to, to read the mediation of technologies and to take them into account when designing them, to read the political, normative, ethical you know, impact of a technology people are designing and it can be an anti-natal diagnostic test or such a technology to read the brain in people who are considered to be brain dead. What's at stake there? And how can we take it into account when designing them, when using them, and making policies? That's typically what we try to do there. And then we end again with a picture like we had in the beginning, exploring humans and technologies, seeing them as opposites or not. Maybe the ultimate image is indeed some kind of an encounter. And we should learn to shake hands with technology. I mean, the hand has played quite a role in this talk already. To shake hands with technology doesn't mean that we give up on ourselves. It means that we accept technology as a counterpart and meeting other people uh, also changes who you are. And I think ultimately that's what we need to accept. As a very last thing I would like actually to thank uh, you for listening to me but also thank two people in particular, Tom, an <laughs> old picture of Tom, <laughs> not such an old picture, <laughs> last maybe. Thanks uh, for, uh, well, enabling me to be here. Uh, we have had so many nice talks already uh, in the room towards uh, me being here. I'm quite sure that uh, there will uh, be many more interesting talks to follow. It's an honor, really, for me. I like it very much. Uh, we had a very inspiring afternoon already uh, before this talk, and I think many more inspiring sessions will follow. So I really feel privileged to, to be here. Thank you for the trust you were putting me, and uh, well, I'm happy to be part of the family. Thank you. Before uh, Charles Taylor wrote a book about multiculturalism on the politics of recognition, I mean, being Canadian, of course, he's going to write about multiculturalism. But in, in the book, he, he draws a distinction between you know cognizing and recognizing, knowing something and then identifying something. And um, if we use that in the framework of technology mediating the world we live in and also being part of it, part of us, can you share some thoughts on uh, how do you how do you view the usage of technology, or uh, the, the effects of technology on consciousness, on the human consciousness, on the human con cognition. Wow, beautiful question. Maybe I would say that um, the difference between uh, those two things regarding technology, so something like recognizing technology and just cognizing a technology, would be knowing that technologies have some kind of implication on uh, for you, for the way in which you live your life and which you do things. But recognizing it would mean that you really have the idea that you should also somehow trust yourself to that technology, that it changes you, that you have to take that leap of faith, maybe even, into uh, well, learning how to live your life in a, in a new way. Maybe it's like um, having a mobile phone and your notifications or WhatsApp on all, all the time, and you, you know that it affects you. And that, that's one thing. The other thing is, okay, you are aware of the fact that it constitutes you as a different person. It makes you less attentive, uh, it makes you less concentrated, uh, even rude towards people, looking at your phone when other people are talking, uh, talking to you, right? At some point, maybe it becomes an existential thing. I don't want to be this person anymore. Then it's not just something you know, but it's something you recognize, that this is really about me. <laughs> and then you take it into account. I'm not sure if that's uh, an answer to your question because I'm not sure if it's about cognition. 
but it's more, I would say, the, the existential word in phenomenology, <laughs> where it's about two ways in which you can know something. And I think that's ultimately also behind what Taylor means with that distinction. Yes? More questions? Yes, Tom? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Tom Wilker Jensen, um, and I'm the professor in techno anthropology, it happens to be. Um, and, uh, and I'm really glad that, that you have been warmly welcomed to, to the family by, by Tom and Lars. Uh, as you probably know, that there are techno anthropologies taking place in several departments, um, and I'm in one of the other departments that are a part of techno anthropology, so, so I would like to welcome you to the extended family as well. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, the, the question I want to ask is something about the uh, about sort of academic traditions and landscapes. Um, uh, I've been going to, to uh, conferences in science and technology for probably too many years. Um, and some years back, there used to be sort of the thing that, that when, there were, um, when there was a track on post phenomenology, uh, there was sort of a strong um, urge to make a sharp distinction between post phenomenology and, for instance, action network theory. So to sort of carve this out as a specific approach. Uh, but uh, when I listen to, to you today, but and also when I listen to contemporary people who have a background in techno anthropology, I think it seems like there's a lot of coming together, it, especially I mean, the way you talk about mediation is very similar to what it has been said about human and non-human agency. Uh, the, the, the approach you, you take uh, to have not sort of a, um, a critical externalist position, but rather to have some kind of critical proximity uh, all of this seems very familiar, so, so do you um, see it the same way, that there is sort of a, a, a great deal of coming together between uh, where action network theory has developed and where post phenomenology is, is developing? Um, or do you see any sort of still clear, interesting distinctions between yep. those two I do. approaches? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, so I think the fact that we don't, do not speak about this all the time anymore means that somehow the arguments have become clear and settled down and there is no animosity or whatsoever, not at all. Uh, I work a lot with people in a &T, but I do think post is different. <laughs> but it's subtle differences, but still important differences. Maybe um, if I would need to explain that in a, uh, well, very briefly, um, maybe the difference is best somewhat characterized by saying that academic theory has a symbiotic approach and phenomenology has a hermeneutic approach. <laughs> and by that I mean, um, for academic theory, the idea is, well, that science and semiotics are just have only have some kind of reference to each other. <clears throat> it's one system, they can define each other, that's all. <clears throat> um, so in that sense, it, it doesn't make any sense to make a sharp distinction between humans and non-humans. They're all just actors. They, they have an impact and having an impact. That, that's all that, that matters. I think in post uh, it's really important to, to have uh, a subtle distinction, no, no separation, but a, a distinction between the human and the non-human. I blur the boundaries between them a lot because I don't think you can have the human without the non-human. But I think a hermeneutic perspective is a perspective from within. So if I yeah, did my work on ultrasound, it was about how ultrasound imaging helps to shape your experience of the unborn child and how in, in that first person perspective, the fetus gets a, well, constituted in a new way and what it means to expect a child gets constituted in a, in a new way. You can see that, of course, from above, as would do it in, in a sense that that's his third person trick in a sense. It's a totally externalist point of view. He describes the network without being part of it. That's a different way of looking at things. You end up at a very similar thing because the media and the role of technologies is all the way there, but I would never see that as, as agency. If somebody asks me in ethics, they, they would come from the other corner, they say, oh, so you think that things are more agent, just like the tour? And, uh, you want to blame a car for a car accident? I said, no, actually, I don't want that. But the bad news is, I don't think humans are moral agents either. <laughs> we can only be moral agents in those configurations where technology mediate morality. So I need a distinction between the two, and the tour can do without it. It's a subtle distinction, but at the level of analysis, I think it makes all the difference why people, for some cases, really come to us and to our session and for us <laughs> because we have that kind of hermeneutic angle where it's about how interpretations take shape through technology, which is harder to tackle with, uh, with an AMT approach.
Yes, more questions? Tom? Yeah. So I would like to follow up on uh, Torben's uh, question uh, uh, regarding uh, the different traditions uh, coming, coming, or approaches coming together. Uh, and I would just make a remark on your, on your uh, comment on uh, critical theory of technology, uh, where you give a very, I would say, neo-Marxist uh, uh, interpretation of critical theory of, uh, of technology. And indeed, it is true that this position criticizes uh, certain social technical conf configurations of being, uh, you know, powerful, oppressing people, things like that. But there is also the alternative. I mean, there's another way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, doing uh, uh, technology or developing uh, technology that is, as I understand it, uh, uh, built on this concept of engagement that you draw in uh, with Dewey. I mean, so there is another way of doing social technical configurations based on engagement, involvement, things like that. Uh, so also here, uh, I think that uh, the different traditions are coming are coming together. Uh, so I think there is a, a dialogue, uh, all, a very fruitful dialogue, <coughs> also in, in, uh, in, in that aspect. Yeah. Uh, regarding, and then now to something completely different, it's, it's the question, because in your discussion on, uh, on ethics and that technology is, uh, is challenging our ethical yardstick, uh, your example, for example, with the with the street lights, for example, uh, and you mentioned that uh, also privacy issues were 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 were, were made uh, questions about autonomy, things like that. Uh, I don't, and you can also take in the example of Langdon Renner with the bridges there, where justice uh, is kind of the, the yardstick. Uh, so I think to some extent these ethical values, I mean, they are still there, they are valid, uh, and they are used uh, to assess different kinds of, uh, of uh, let's say, social technical configurations, uh, but the values are, are still there. However, I think it's true that technology makes new uh, uh, ethical values or makes them necessary. And you mentioned in the beginning, Hans Jonas, uh, where this increased power of uh, technology then says, okay, so we need to uh, have an ethical value of precaution, for example, because we have new, new, uh, new uh, this enhanced power. So my question is then, uh, if you could make it more precise, what are the new ethical values uh, that uh, post phenomenology and the theory of mediation uh, uh, reveals to us? I, I, so I think you, you, you could say that uh, I would see it along the same lines as you could say that an ultrasound image constitutes the fetus and constitutes what it means to be pregnant. So, of course, there is still a word privacy and there is a word justice, etc. But what it means practice in a very quick situation uh, is not given uh, beforehand. I mean, if you try to ex expand on, on Kant or something, you could maybe work towards a concept that people implicitly uh, formulate online, but it's not there yet. We have never thought that that is also something that justice could mean, or care could, could mean or something. And that's actually what I find so interesting. And of course, ethics is not it's never just an algorithm where you apply a value to a technology. You have to interpret that value. And that's what continuously changes. But that's maybe more. Uh, and then indeed, such a principle of precaution uh, seems to go hand in hand with the development of new technologies. But also there, I think you see a lot of different takes on what precaution means. I think one of the very first talks I heard Latour give was about the precaution principle, and his first remark was that he would have never got married if he would have really followed the precaution principle. And if something can go wrong, never do it. And that's, that's not a way to, to live your life. You have to, to jump. So uh, uh, maybe you can add that. There are many people who now try to work on it, like, oh, we have to see technologies as social experiments, which we should conduct in a responsible way. People who pool, delft, how it is working on something like that. So it's again an, another interpretation of what that same principle can can mean. Mm -hmm. Yes? Beer, more questions? Or yes? Please go ahead. I'd like to ask you a question about morality. 
uh, being linked to whether it's the object or the subject you've talked about, or it's a, it's a discussion about whether it's the gun or it's the man who's killing, and you could say it's the gunman. Um, but if we take this discussion towards the uh, AI thing, which is about to happen or is happening right now, whereas technology might might have morality itself, maybe we should like implement the morality to the AI, and then the AI would somehow, I don't know, compute the morality. But my question is, what kind of morality should we implement into the AI? Yeah. This is uh, I mean, the central question that is now popping up around AI, right? And I think there is maybe at some point also a, a thinking mistake in that question. <laughs> a mistake that we always make when there is new technology, because you tend to see technology then as an alternative to humans. So the machine will make a moral decision, and where in the old situation humans would make a moral decision. That means that we cannot see the system yet as a mediator. But I think ultimately, if you would, for instance, think about autonomous cars, that's the, the, the example of what should kill an elderly lady who's crossing the road or put itself against the wall and kill three kids at the, at the back seat. Mm -hmm. um, it's ultimately still us somehow embedding that car in our system of transportation, where it mediates how we do transportation, <laughs> where we can still take responsibility for using that car. You can never cut it loose from the humans that use it. So that means that uh, at least there is still a lot of human responsibility there for how to deal, how to use the car. And I think one of the first things you will then discover if you really want to uh, build an ethical theory into a technology, that fortunately there is not one single ethical theory that is the true best ethical theory and you could push the button and it's an algorithm and then you have an ethical choice. That's the whole point of ethics. It's not objective at all, it's also not totally subjective. <laughs> there are good arguments, but it's not something that you can do without thought and deliberation, etc. So as soon as you see the technology as being embedded in a practice of humans, it will always fail taking over the role of humans. And I'm quite sure that we will eventually need to learn to see it as part of the human relation. For instance, if I look at those cars, my prediction would be that we're going to adapt the roads to that car. <laughs> and there's only a few places where you can still cross the road, a place that's very recognizable with a beacon or something for such an autonomous car, and then we can, can still take as humans the responsibility for the, the ethical question that a car might encounter, because we have answered that question then already mm -hmm. beforehand. Last thing maybe, this is even more urgent when it comes to weapons, autonomous weapons, and of course there's also a, a gray zone. I mean, we already have them in a sense. If we can uh, fire a bomb and it goes to Iraq and it goes through a chimney. You know, what, what, what did we see on TV in those uh, days? And it can find its target autonomously. But still, there's still uh, some form of human, of meaningful human control, as they say. And we set the target, etc. And then the algorithm can, can find the target. But if the bomb could, could learn and say, well, actually, I now have come to the conclusion. If, if one could say that, that that person over there should die because I think on my big data system that that person does not have a right to live, and then you eliminate human control. And I think seeing it as part of a human relation would not well, uh, give any room for that. And this is typically, I think, a lot of discussion that takes place now in AI and ethics moving in that direction. I hope it's a bit of an answer. <laughs> It's complicated stuff. Okay. So we end this part of the show here. Thank you, Nicole, for thank you. And with uh, beers, perhaps bubbles, even. And sodas and snacks in the canteen, the big canteen out there. <laughs>